Okay, well, I'm going to, um, to kick us off and then uh, as people continue to join. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to our HIV Center Thursday rounds. It's, it's uh, good to have you all here. Uh, happy fall. It's getting chilly for some of us, but um, we're entering a new season. Um, hope everyone's um, doing well and staying healthy. So let me um, just remind you of a few upcoming rounds. On November 18th, we have David Holgrave. Um, talking about HIV and COVID public health responses, lessons learned from each to inform the other. That's November 18th, David Holgrave, December 2nd, we have Avram Finkelstein. Uh, title of the talk is AIDS and the Dilemma of the 21st Century Image, December 2nd. And then um, December 16th, we have two of our former fellows, uh, Rita Melendez and David Knapp Whittier, and, and I'll give you their titles and give you more details when we, um, at our next Grand Rounds meeting. So um, hope to see you November 18th for David Holgrave. And then I'm very, very pleased to be introducing uh, today's presenter, uh, Dr. Carmen Logie, who is an associate professor at the Factor in Wintosh Faculty of Social Work, University of Toronto, and the Canada Research Chair in Global Health Equity and Social Justice with Marginalized Populations. She is also an adjunct um, I'm sorry, that's my place. Um, yeah, she's also an adjunct professor at the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health, research scientist at the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity, and adjunct scientist at Women's College Hospital. She wears many important hats. <laughs> Dr. Logie's research program advances understanding of and develops interventions to address intersectional stigma, and other social ecological factors associated with health disparities with a focus on HIV. Her current community-based research focuses on HIV prevention, testing and care, cascades in Canada, Uganda, and Jamaica with people living with HIV, refugee, and other displaced youth, LGBTQ communities, sex workers, indigenous youth, and persons at the intersection of these identities. She's a deputy editor at the Journal of the International AIDS Society and on editorial boards for social science and medicine health and plus, plus global health. Her latest book, Working with Excluded Populations in HIV, Hard to Reach or Out of Sight? Question mark, was released in 2021 as part of the Social Aspects of HIV book series. Um, on a more personal note, uh, Carmen's been a, a, a very important consultant, advisor, and participant in, in the HBTN 096. Um, study for getting to zero among Black MSM in the U.S. South, of which I'm one of the co-chairs, and she's been really uh, instrumental in helping us develop that integrated strategies intervention, and I've gotten to know Carmen through uh, other NIH activities and stigma workshops, and it's just um, really a pleasure to have you here, Carmen. So I'll turn it over to you, remind everyone to stay on mute during the presentation, and then um, my colleague, Stephen Sukumaran, will be monitoring the discussion um, after Carmen's presentation. So over to you, Carmen. Thank you so much for those kind words, the long introduction, and um, for having me today. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about intersectional stigma and linkages with the HIV prevention and care cascade in different global contexts. I just want to acknowledge that I'm on it, uh, the indigenous traditional territories of the Minis Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, and I'm on uh, Treaty 13 territory. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about three different things. Well, more than that, but <laughs> the three different categories in the talk uh, is first of all, just situating what we mean by intersectionality and stigma. Uh, providing some case studies from different global contexts and some considerations for us moving forward. I just want to start off uh, by acknowledging that I am a white person on um, Indigenous land. I am a settler, therefore I'm a first-generation Canadian. My parents immigrated here. I'm a first-generation uh, scholar, first I went to go to um, university or college, and I also identify as gay. So I have very various positionalities that uh, shape how I move through the world and shape various privileges and uh, marginalities. I also identify as a cisgender woman. So um, yeah, so I wanna just start off by saying 
Uh, let's conceptualize intersectionality and stigma so that we're all on the same page. And so the roots of intersectionality are often uh, traced back to um, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw's really important work. Um, but before that, the Combahee River Collective was a collective of Black feminists uh, in the 70s, 1970s. And this is a very uh, well-known statement that I, I feel is still worth repeating. Um, the Compahee River Collective Statement, uh, we're actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and see as a particular task the development of integrated analyses and practice based on the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking, and the synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of our lives. And even before that, uh, Sojourner Truth uh, called attention to the specific forms of discrimination she faced based on the intersection of her race and her gender. And Dr. Lisa Boleg's important work uh, also helps us think about intersectional ways of approaching stigma discrimination. Um, for instance, here she describes that uh, intersectionality as a framework looks at the way that multiple social categories, such as race, gender, sexual identity, intersect at an individual level of experience and reflect these multiple interlocking systems of privilege and oppression at macro levels. And so the way that we've been approaching stigma uh, is that it's a multi-level phenomena. So it doesn't just occur at the individual level, occur, occurs at relational levels, community levels, institutional levels. Ultimately, it reduces opportunities uh, and exacerbates inequities. And structural perspectives help us move from an individual gaze um, to thinking about the ways that uh, institutions, policies, norms, and ideologies both produce and reproduce these inequities. And so when we put together these conceptualizations of stigma and inter intersectionality, we come to intersectional stigma. I want to acknowledge the work of Michelle Tracy Berger and uh, who really uh, coined the term intersectional stigma. Uh, about a decade ago, actually, uh, at teams I was working on in Canada, we did focus groups, many focus groups in five cities, 15 focus groups with women living with HIV. And so the, the conceptual model on the right is really what we found. We found the intersection of sex work stigma, racism, homophobia and transphobia, gender discrimination, and HIV stigma that really spanned micro, meso, and macro levels. And notably, uh, there was also, you see on the, the pizza pie slice on the left, uh, resistance and coping, the way people navigated stigma also spanned micro levels, meso levels, so resilience, meso levels, social support, and at the macro level, advocacy and, and challenging stigma. And even more recently, uh, Dr. Janet Turan, uh, among a, a few of us working on NIH stigma working groups for a special co collection in BMC Medicine on stigma research and global health, we uh, were looking at challenges and opportunities in, in addressing uh, intersectional stigma and health. And that's open access if you wanted to, to look at that article. And at the same time, we've been looking at how can we think about an intersectional and integrated conceptual framework to understand stigma. There's been many, many different stigma frameworks. However, they're often limited to one, one specific health issue or one social identity. Uh, they look largely at psychological processes, so not always integrating the psychological processes along with social and structural pathways, and they might not consider intersecting identities and health issues. And a lot of times people are uh, conceptualized as a stigmatized person or a stigmatizer wherein from an intersectional perspective, we hold many positionalities. Some of them are associated with privilege and some with, with marginalization. And so Dr. Uh, Ann Stengel and a group of us uh, from very different uh, facets of stigma, including epilepsy stigma, mental health stigma, HIV stigma, LGBTQ stigma, uh, came up with this model that, that can be used for everybody. So for people who are experiencing stigma in some facets of their life, but might also be enacting stigma and really, I think what this, this adds is looking at the root of stigma. So looking at these drivers of stigma, things such as judgment, blame, stereotypes, and prejudice, as well as facilitators. And facilitators can be things that um, 
are positive that can reduce stigma, such as protective laws. But laws can also um, perpetuate stigma, which we'll be talking about that today. So I just wanted to start off with, with that brief overview of intersectionality and stigma. And so I'm going to be uh, presenting three different case studies of how our teams have been applying intersectionality uh, to stigma research and, and HIV research more generally. The first example is from work that I've been doing for the last several years uh, with urban, refugee, and displaced youth in Kampala in Uganda. This is a community-based research project. Uh, all of my research is community-based, which means that I work with community organizations. The community organizations uh, tell me what are their priorities and, and needs and work together collaboratively. Uh, we have shared data ownership for instance, um, shared publications. Uh, this uh, was a, also inspired by a doctoral student I was working with who's now a professor, Dr. Moses Akumu. And he actually uh, leveraged work we've been doing for his doctoral uh, dissertation, which he's, he's in the process of publishing. And so what I'm presenting is some of the findings and I'm, and I'm presenting more than what is in this recent article in Journal of the International AIDS Society, which is how intersecting stigma shapes HIV testing practices. And so this really uh, stemmed from quantitative research we had done. We had done a, a cross-sectional survey with refugee and displaced youth living in, in slums. Um, I use the word slum very specifically because not all informal settlements are, are slums. And so uh, slums are shared social entities that lack um, either uh, secure housing, secure tenure, sufficient um, resources such as water, sanitation. And uh, so we worked with uh, many different uh, peer navigators. So we hired a refugee youth uh, aged 18 to 24 and trained them as uh, research assistants or so as peer navigators. And in the study that is um, snapshotted on the left, we found that it was actually adolescent sexual and reproductive health stigma that was associated with reduced testing, more so than HIV stigma in, in, the, in the quantitative findings. So adolescent sexual and reproductive health stigma refers to the shame and blame that adolescents experience accessing any sexual or reproductive health services. So including condoms, including HIV testing, including contraception. And so we actually validated a scale that was developed in Ghana with university students, and we validated it in, in Uganda with refugee and displaced youth. And we actually found a different structure of the scale. Um, I'm happy to, to share that with you, but just notably, there was actually two separate um, subscales. One was on uh, accessing um, contraception, and the other one was on, on adolescent pregnancy. And so it was really um, important when we're thinking about young people to think about the stigma they experience based on being a young per person who's engaging in, in sexual practices. So knowing that, that was something that we took into consideration in our qualitative study. And so we conducted five focus groups with refugee youth. Uh, we, we, we divided the ages into 16 to 19 and then 20 to 24 year olds. And we uh, separated them by gender. Um, and uh, we also uh, included one with with young female sex workers who are refugees. And so we really found, and I'm just highlighting in, in bold, but I'll be briefly touching on some drivers of testing and, inter and intersectional stigma related drivers were fear of testing HIV positive um, and blame and shame for sexual activity, which, which I mentioned is part of adolescent sexual and reproductive health stigma. So drivers are these attitudes and beliefs that can increase HIV vulnerability, such as fear and misinformation. And so we really see this persistent fear of testing positive for HIV across global contexts. And this is this was conducted, you know, very recently and is still persisting. And we see a convergence of HIV stigma and low treatment literacy. So a young a man. Um, in the 16 to 19 year old focus group described, recently I went to the hospital for testing and I felt if I'm positive, 
and society gets to know that the way they've been treating me will be much different. Uh, they will be isolating me. And a young woman talked about this blame and shame for being sexually active. So those who are negative fear going back for another test. So even if you're HIV negative and getting tested, you're afraid to go again because people will think they go around with sleeping people. So most people don't wanna have that experience of being judged. I think, I know I don't. And so other uh, important considerations around stigma are uh, facilitators at legal, institutional and community levels. For instance, we found legal precarity of sex work, um, same gender practices, immigration status played a role in testing considerations, um, healthcare mistreatment and sexual and gender-based violence. For instance, people felt that they were legally precarious. They were seeking asylum, often um, coming to Uganda with the hope of going to another country for resettlement. So uh, one of our key informants described, remember most of the refugees here, they wanna go for asylum. If they test positive, they think there's a possibility they'll be denied. So they won't feel comfortable. The majority will not feel comfortable going for an HIV test. Um, and for healthcare mistreatment, um, People would talk about being judged, for, as I mentioned before, for being sexually active youth. They also, we also have, you know, a lot of experience of being judged for being a refugee. Uh, when people like us youth go to the hospital, the person will start mistreating you. How come such a young kid do such and such? You are the youths who go to the streets and get sex workers. You are spoiled. So you end up losing respect. That's why, no, even though I have sex or not, I will not go to the hospital. And this is a young man. And I just want to also note that there was uh, refugees who describe being called animals and treated like animals for being refugees. Um, so there's also xenophobia experiences, but for the sake of time, I'm not, I'm not presenting all of the findings. And gender inequity persists and remains a very strong uh, driver of HIV risks because people are not able to, young women are not able to, um, enact agency in many situations, not in all situations, but in many. So we did know that gender inequity uh, shaped people's and young women specifically perspectives of HIV testing with partners, which is often recommended. And um, in this context, there was some hesitancy. Uh, a young woman described, the boyfriend can give this HIV self-test to you but insist you test in their presence. And if you're HIV positive, it can lead to separation. It was very common um, in a key informant uh, said, giving this HIV self-test, we were asking about self-testing, uh, might bring violence. They may be like, why are you giving me this? You don't trust me. It can bring conflicts. Not everyone can dis disclose their status. So there's gender norms intersecting with HIV stigma. And, um, you know, this was also described the, the double standard. So if, if a lady tests positive or negative and is asked to bring in a, a male partner, um, this, this key informant states, our men, if you tell them, let us test, they'll say, I'm, I'm having sex with, with other men. And that would have negative repercussions. So there is a lot of uh, this tensions in gender equity around um, HIV self-testing and, and testing in general. And there was legal, I really wanted to add this slide for this talk specifically, because there's also this um, intersecting legal precarity of refugees who are also sex workers. And so um, refugee sex workers described, you know, refugee sex workers are not Ugandan. And some of them are not registered. So some people are, are seeking asylum or uh, undocumented. That limits them testing because they believe they're illegally in the country. Maybe they're also in a country where they feel they're not accepted. So there's self-stigma. Um, and also thinking about um, the criminalization of same gender sexual practices in Uganda. And so we did as much as possible try to collaborate with refugee LGBTQ agencies. And we have some perspectives in, the, in, our, in our data. Um, homosexuality is illegal in our country. There are sex workers who sell to both men and women so bisexual sex workers, and they might uh, that might limit them from being comfortable accessing services. And so here we really see the intersection of, of stigma around being a refugee, a youth, a sexually active youth, around HIV, 
sex work, LGBTQ, and um, gender and gender norms. And we map this onto the, the health stigma and discrimination framework that I mentioned earlier, just to, to note the utility of this framework actually in, in exploring these different facets of um, social identity stigma, health condition stigma, and then the specific uh, drivers and facilitators. Um, and for facilitators, we included things that, that are uh, amenable to change. So social and gender norms uh, could be supportive, uh, could be equitable. Uh, also the legal environment is something also that we can change and peer support and engagement also emerged. And the drivers, you know, I also have to believe that they can be changed too. So fear of infection, uh, misinformation and, and judgment are all things that um, can be addressed with, with increased um, treatment literacy. That's, that's contextually age and language tailored. So um, yeah, and some of our, our work in, in Uganda, even now in review, people are like, well, there's testing everywhere. People can just go, but we have, we've published a, a a bit from our work there and people have clearly said that uh, they don't have funds for the transportation to get to the clinic that they might not want to go to a clinic near their their own home due to confidentiality concerns so they need to travel further and then they don't have those funds so there's there are still barriers uh, that are financial related that are language related because refugees um, that we work with are largely from the democratic republic of congo rwanda burundi I also have different projects in the far north of Uganda where we're mainly working with South Sudanese refugees, but generally the people we're working with are from the DRC um, and we offer our surveys and our all of our research in five languages. So in, in English, French, Luganda, Kinyarwanda, Kurundi, and Swahili, but the, not all of the testing is offered in those languages. It's usually offered in Luganda and English, which is spoken by very few. Um, of the refugees, at least that, that, that we're working with. And so if we're thinking about what does it mean to create a health enabling environment for HIV prevention, yes, we can consider self-testing, peer support, engaging uh, tr gender transformative approaches to um, thinking about working with young men and, and, and young women and all folks, um, and these multi-level interventions that address intersecting stigma. Um, but we also have to think about the impacts of COVID-19. So we've been uh, conducting a, a cohort survey and our last uh, round of surveys in April, 2021, 20% uh, of our participants uh, out of 346 remained untested for HIV, even though we offered HIV self-testing kits. And even though we, we were an HIV self-testing intervention or an HIV intervention, uh, clinic-based testing, self-testing, point of care testing, we offered every kind of testing that you can offer. And uh, we still 20% did not wanna test. Um, and we had two thirds report food insecurity, which is extremely alarming. And I'm working on a, a livelihoods um, strengthening grant right now. Uh, one quarter reported problematic alcohol use, one third moderate or severe depression with a PHQ-9. And we asked, you know, had COVID impacted sexual health access such as condoms testing and 30% said yes. And 30% also said that it um, impacted reproductive health access such as access to contraception and abortion. And we had almost 10% reported unplanned pregnancy in the pandemic. This is a 16 to 24 year olds and 9% transactional sex, which is actually lower than we had measured before. So there could be some uh, self-report bias there. So we just did finish on a COVID-19 study. And as part of the knowledge mobilization, we made a, a comic book with all the qualitative findings. Largely it's around preventive practices, mental health, coping. Um, this was the one that was around um, HIV. So I decided to share one of the images because I think they're very beautiful. And um, yeah, so the next um, example that I'm going to give is from our work with young people living with HIV in Jamaica. So I've been uh, working in Jamaica with uh, community-based projects with Jamaica AIDS Support for Life and other community partners since 2013. And we've published a lot from our, our data uh, that we collected in the first study we did from 2013 to 2017. We did um, 
a lot of qualitative data collection and quantitative data collection looking at um, HIV prevention engagement, HIV vulnerabilities. And then after that, <laughs> uh, to make AIDS support for life was like, well, we need to address barriers to adherence. So as many of you might know, uh, both uh, sex work and um, same gender sexual practices are criminalized in Jamaica. And uh, there's also a very high HIV prevalence among uh, gay and bisexual men, uh, uh, estimated at 29.8%, and trans women are estimated at 50%, and sex workers is estimated at approximately 2%. There's also really low ART, uh, antiretroviral therapy engagement. Only about 44% of people living with HIV are estimated to be taking ART, and only 35% um, of people living with HIV in Jamaica have uh, an undetectable viral load. So that's really far from the UNAIDS 95, 95, 95. That's a very big gap. And um, the uh, JN Plus, which is a, a Jamaican organization we work with, Jamaica Network of Seropositive People, uh, people living with HIV, uh, community-based organization. Um, their 2020 uh, P people living with HIV uh, stigma index uh, reported that 38% of people that they surveyed uh, delayed testing due to you know fear of other people's reactions and also delayed treatment. And and about half uh, reported HIV-related stigma discrimination. So that's suggesting that their fears of reactions and mistreatment are well-founded. Uh, so what we did was, and this is, a, as all of you are doing research in a pandemic now, it's a bit challenging to be doing research in the pandemic. So this project has been a little bit delayed, but we did, uh, did manage to conduct nine focus groups uh, between 2020 and 2021 with young people living with HIV age 16 to 24, three focus groups to risk sex workers, three with trans women, and three with gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men or MSM. And we did three focus groups per site, one with each group. So in Kingston, we did one focus group with, with young gay men, one with trans women, and one with sex workers, and the same as in Montego Bay and, and Ocho Rios. And I um, co-facilitated and you know worked to support uh, the uh, Jamaica Aid Support for Life team in connecting um, the, 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 the focus groups. So I only co-facilitated um, a couple in Kingston with a team member and then they, they, they facilitated the rest. And so uh, there really is this intersecting uh, stigma and social norms that profoundly shapes uh, experience, lived experiences, day-to-day -day life, quality of life um, with people living with, HIV, especially from key populations. Um, so when trans women uh, talked about, you know, as soon as they found out that um, there was uh, a sex worker living with HIV, people stopped, you know, uh, purchasing services from her. And even my father, who was her barber, stopped trimming her her hair. What if it was me? And so people really are 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 actually witnessing a lot of. Um, differential treatment and, and that is profoundly impacting their own understanding of what it's like to be living with HIV. And there's also the intersection of HIV stigma with LGBTQ stigma. So this um, young gay man in, in Montego Bay described, well, for our community, the MSM, so the men of sex with men community and the TG of the transgender community, whenever they find out that you have HIV, they begin to discriminate against you. They'll tell you you're dead. These are some of the names they use in the stigma to categorize MSM. It has brought a stigma so people look at you differently. I hear straight people say if someone has AIDS, they're poisoned and gay and they can't come around them again and they'll say they're happy. They never took any food from you. And this was a really um, big uh, thing that came up. It was people not taking food or eating food from people living with HIV. And this is in 2020 and 2021. So this is a really pervasive um, treatment literacy uh, issues that, that I'm not sure why we are not able to fix at this point in time uh, with all the work we're doing on treatment literacy. But this has been since we started doing this work in 2013, this pervasive fear of, of HIV acquisition through food. Um, 
And also the stigmatizing social norms also happen within communities, for instance, within communities of sex workers. Um, so it's internalized and then um, shapes the way that communities interact with, with one another. For instance, a sex worker in Kingston described, uh, we always look down on each other. Even if you're HIV positive and nobody knows your status, we tend to look down on the person who comes out and says they're positive. We try to stigmatize them because who are you to be selling sex or why are you HIV positive? Why didn't you protect yourself? So you, you see in here a lot of blame um, and, and, and within um, community also, also stigma, obviously uh, reflecting the larger stigma in society. And this also was very common. So stigmatizing family norms that really, and this is something we documented for many years that a lot of people experience family mistreatment and that leads to homelessness and to survival sex work, and then often to um, increase HIV acquisition risks. So um, a trans woman described that, you know, she left her house when she was 13 because she wasn't accepted by her family. So 13, and she didn't see them for nine years, but she was accepted in the house with like um, other, other gay and trans folks. And her family did not call once, but that she found a safe space. So this also really is, is strength-based and shows the community and the connectedness and support um, within the LGBTQ community in, um, in every place in the world, including in Jamaica. And this, I was part of the, the co-facilitating this focus group and it really, really was uh, heartbreaking. This young, young gay man described uh, discrimination at his home when I lived with my mom. After she found out he was HIV positive, she separated the utensils and I was in a room with my little brother and she took him out of the room and gave me the space. And she also said afterwards um, that he wasn't allowed to hug his little brother anymore. It's like, so sad. Um, and another uh, a trans woman described, I remember when I turned to my family, you know, telling them she was positive. And I was looking for them to say motivating word, but in the, instead they, um, her mom said, Lord Jesus, if I were you, I would go and hang myself. And so what we did with that, this data, we were supposed to be doing an intervention, but it's COVID. So we sort of we pivoted um, and we're using comics. We've been using comics in our work in Uganda as well, but we created comics across the cascade of care that um, shared back the experience we found in the focus groups um, and then we're creating a blank version so that we're going to be doing interviews where the uh, individual interviews with the participant will also fill in the comics with their own experiences and their own ideas so in this comic um, is is the very first stage where people go to get an hiv test so this is the first stage of the cascade when they're learning that um, they're living with hiv and so this is some of the reactions you know, people and this is done in patois with with all all with our collaborators at Jamaica Aid Support and, and who have offices in Kingston, Ocherios, and Montego Bay. So um, the doctor is giving the results, and people and the people are thinking, you know, who am I going to tell? I can't trust anybody. Am I going to die soon? Um, I might as well be dead. This is what we actually heard from the the focus groups. And then the right um, people said, I'm going to, you know, delete my social media. What am I going to do? I'm going to stop to talking to my friends. And here uh, is some of the barriers to, to adhering to medication, ART medication, um, spanning from not having enough food to eat and not being able to take medication on an empty belly, having a party to go to later and not knowing how you're gonna feel, not having money to go to the, the, the clinic, uh, being worried that you're telling your partner if they're gonna leave you, how are you gonna take um, medication uh, at work when there's a security guard who checks your bag and there's always people around or how are you going to take it at your home when you're living in a really crowded environment what if the nurse at the clinic is going to tell people what if the pharmacist uh, is going to say something out loud and then someone i know is there and is going to find out so these are all and so what we're going to do as i mentioned is all the the thought bubbles are going to we're going to share this and then a, a blank version which we've we've done before for part of participatory comics and finally part of the cascade is living well with HIV. So we also looked at all of the um, the ways that people, and we did, I didn't for the sake of time today, uh, share all of the ways that people are navigating 
and, and coping, living with HIV in a positive way. But um, here are some of them, uh, people talking about, uh, there's a support group at Jassel, at Jamaica AIDS Support for Life. Um, all you have to do is take your medication and you can live a long and healthy, healthy life. Uh, my friends support me when I'm feeling low. Um, you know, I wanna take this medication because I want my body to look good. Uh, you know, I want my skin to look good. I have little children I wanna live for. And I'm happy to tell anybody that you can live a good life like anybody else. Um, so that, that's sort of our living positively uh, uh, findings. And we're hoping to build on that in our, in our comic interviews. And so for this example, you really see the intersection of sexual and gender minority stigma, uh, sex work and HIV stigma. And so the final example I'm gonna give uh, is around um, how intersectionality can uh, help us understand the HIV care needs for uh, women living with HIV in Canada engaged in sex work. And this is a recent analysis that's in uh, revision right now. So hopefully you'll be seeing it soon. And so we, we know, and I, I know you all know that sex workers are marginalized across various global contexts. Uh, in, including um, legally uh, increasing exposure to violence, arrest, incarceration, and stigma towards anything, including sex work, inter intersects with other types of stigma. So it intersects with gender inequities, it intersects with HIV, intersects with racism. And so we were looking at longitudinal associations between um, engaging in recent sex work, so past six months sex work, and various outcomes, including stigma, psychosocial, and clinical outcomes among a cohort of, of women with HIV in Canada. And so we looked at past six month sex work engagement. And this was over uh, three waves of a five-year study. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna read all the details out to you, but we had uh, 1,422 participants uh, and uh, 129, so 9.1% reported sex work during at least one of the three waves of the study um, over the five years. So that, that in and of itself is interesting. There's not a lot of work on among a, a large cohort of women living, living with HIV, how many um, are sex work engaged? And this actually uh, changed by wave. So there were people who were sex work engaged at wave one, but not at wave two. And so that it varied across waves. And so we, we adjusted for a lot of variables, which I'm gonna talk about later province, age, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, education, ethnicity, and housing insecurity. And we found that recent sex work was linked with almost two and a half fold higher odds of past three month violence, um, three and a half fold uh, higher odds of past six month injection drug use, uh, you know, uh, double the odds of hazardous alcohol use and one and a half odds of uh, clinical depression. And in, in unadjusted analyses, it was also linked with HIV clinical outcomes um, and gender discrimination. But we adjusted for a lot of things, as you know. So I'm not gonna go over much here, just to say that, um, that sex work was actually associated with a lot of these variables. So it was associated with um, younger age, uh, lower education, being lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, sexual identity, um, a transgender gender identity, uh, indigenous uh, identity versus non-indigenous, um, insecure housing and uh, lower income. So these are all really important uh, social demographic factors to consider. And these are the, the results that I already described. Uh, and so in, in this is what I also find is very interesting. As I mentioned, there were uh, differences in who was more likely to report recent sex work based on sexual and gender identity, lower income, and those who reported sex work in wave one uh, were more likely to be lost to follow up. And lost to follow up were more likely to identify as in being indigenous, a transgender, a lesbian, a gay, bisexual, queer, unstably housed and low income. And so our finding, which may not seem that radically new that sex work, recent sex work among women living with HIV is linked with co-occurring social disparities such as violence 
in health disparities, substance use and depression, showing a syndemic lens. I just want to uh, call attention to, this is still an issue. We're 40 years into the, the HIV epidemic, pandemic, and we're still finding uh, violence, um, substance use, and uh, HIV interconnections that we have not adequately addressed. The fact we're still seeing this really means that we have not been paying attention um, to really addressing the needs of sex working um, people and the, the marginalities they experience that increase their exposure to violence um, and, and HIV. And so, yes, you know, syndemics is still extremely relevant. And this article by Singer was written more than 20 years ago. So I really think, you know, what we need to do is, is be thinking about all of the, the intersecting experiences and identities um, around sex work and violence and substance use or injection drug use, specifically alcohol use and depression, but also thinking about the other social um, identities that were linked to sex work, such as low income, transgender, indigenous, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer, and homelessness. And um, there's been a lot of work that has shown that until we address the human rights and sexual rights of sex workers, we are not going to be able to uh, prevent HIV among sex workers or um, ensure adequate HIV care among sex workers. So a human rights-based approach is absolutely essential for uh, sex working people living with HIV and not living with HIV to realize their optimal health and well being. And so, taken together, we really see these intersecting forms of stigma alongside HIV stigma that we've mentioned, and violence and poverty uh, are still producing structural violence that reduces, for instance, in the case that I presented with Kampala, reduces engagement with HIV testing. And um, in the case in um, Jamaica, uh, reduces likelihood of being able to take medication and realize viral suppression. And among um, sex workers who are women living with HIV in Canada, um, it really, you know, the, the, a lot of people talk about the, the other uh, outcome for people living with HIV is quality of life. And so when people are, have much higher exposure to violence, uh, they're also not realizing the full uh, benefit of the HIV cascade if we're thinking about quality of life. And so um, the last section I just wanna uh, leave you with is some considerations for how to move forward because there's hope and there's lots we can do. Um, and so it's really important that we explore not only stigma and intersecting stigma and oppression, but also strengths. Um, so this is a recent article, which I'm gonna talk about soon, but uh, is open access that we looked at, how have any strength-based or empowerment perspectives be integrate, being integrated in quanti quantitative intersectional stigma research? And so we looked across uh, lots of quantitative studies, and we found that the majority didn't look at any strength-based factors, so no moderating, mediating factors that could be considered a strength, like social support, resilience, um, and so we're really not looking at the strengths of communities if all we do in stigma research is look at um, the oppression, and therefore we're not acknowledging the resources that people have and the way that they're navigating their lives and the ways um, that interventions could support the resources that are within communities and the resilience that is within communities. And I want to, um, I actually want to read this out to you. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, whose work has been um, foundational to our understanding of intersectionality, uh, really talks about the importance of not just viewing intersectionality as a deficits-based perspective. So she, uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, um, but she basically said that, uh, you know, race, gender, and other um, marginalizations are treated as intrinsically negative frameworks in which social power works to exclude or marginalize those who are different. 
According to this understanding, our liberatory objective should be to empty such categories of any social significance. Yet implicit in certain strands of feminist and racial liberation movements is a view that the social power and delineating difference may not be the power of domination. It can instead be the, so the source of social empowerment and reconstruction. So if you remember the figure I showed you at the beginning, our intersectional stigma conceptual model, where there was that slice, that kind of pie, you know, we did recognize that people, even within these contexts of stigma and intersection, intersecting stigma um, and marginalization, they are still um, surviving, ex uh, manifesting resilience, resistance, social support, solidarity, uh, agency, uh, advocacy, and this is what you know, uh, uh, Kimberly, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw is is noting that. We don't want to necessarily get rid of the idea of race, get rid of the idea of gender. What we want to do is um, get rid of the domination and inequalities associated with race and gender and see how can we think about the social empowerment um, associated with various social identities. I mean, you know, um, yeah. So anyways, as I mentioned, the article we, we just um, published showed only 40% of any studies of intersecting stigma looked at any factors and that were strength-based um, and most were at the individual or interpersonal level. So I really call on, on you all to, to think more about the community level factors. So social cohesion, collective efficacy, community connectedness, solidarity, and the structural factors. So activism, policy change, we see um, Black Lives Matter, uh, we see pride, there's so many ways that communities have been um, gathering and, and um, engaging in activism to promote social change. And, and if we can put more of a focus on the ways that people are already navigating stigma, uh, we can produce more of a balanced perspective than, than one that fo solely focuses on, on problems that people are experiencing. And I also wanna uh, draw attention to Dr. Eve Tuck's work uh, where she talks about researching for desire. And she, uh, and I'm just gonna read part of this. Uh, I wanna identify, she's an indigenous scholar. I write to identify a persistent trend in research on native communities, cities and other disenfran disenfranchised communities, what I call damage centered research. I invite you to join me in re-envisioning research in our communities, not only to recognize the need to document the effects of oppression, but to consider the long-term re repercussions of thinking of ourselves as broken. Desire-based research frameworks are concerned with understanding complexity, contradiction, and the self-determination of lived lives. So what might it be like to shift towards researching for desire? And this is my last slide, I think. And I just wanna note a couple of other concepts that are very exciting to me. One is a recent article in The Lancet on sexual well-being and sexual justice that really focuses on um, you know, the social, structural, legal supports for person-centered sexual and reproductive experiences. It looks at sexual pleasure, sexual health, sexual rights, and sexual justice as being interconnected. So therefore we can address violence and stigma from a trauma-informed sex-positive approach and look at how sexuality and sexual expression contribute to our overall well-being. And the last, um, the last sentence of my book before I knew that it was a thing was about flourishing, which in the dictionary is to grow luxuriantly. But there's actually a, a growing body of research on flourishing as a concept, which means how people themselves describe what it means to live a good life um, for instance, this recent article in BMJ Global Health described flourishing as an active process of striving to live in keeping with one's defining values, commitments, and vision for the future as individuals in, and in the context of one's family and the communities to one, which one belongs. There's more people writing. And in the context of HIV, people have also been writing about flourishing and it's growing. There's gonna be a special issue coming out um, in social science and medicine, mental health, uh, that addresses flourishing. I want to uh, call attention to Dr. Emily Mendenhall's work, who also touches on flourishing as a way of, 
of thinking about beyond resilience. So resilience is good, but it's always in relationship to adversity. So does it mean just to define what a good life, living a good life means in the context of people who are either at increased HIV acquisition risk or people who are living with, with HIV? And so closing thoughts, uh, how can we balance our attention to both stigma and agency? Uh, so oppression and resistance. Uh, how can we think about structural community, relational, interpersonal dimensions of stigma with a focus on power? And what might it be to, to move towards flourishing and desire-based research? And I just wanna acknowledge, thank you for being here today. I'm gonna acknowledge all the funders, uh, collaborators, uh, and yeah, all the teams for all the different projects. And uh, if you're interested, the, the book that I was part of uh, is, is in the top. Well, I actually wrote the book, it took me two years. So <laughs> if you wanna read it, I'd be very happy. We actually, in the book, each chapter is on a different concept with regards to um, challenging the idea that people are hard to reach. So for instance, one chapter is on critical hope, one's on love and solidarity, one's on imagination and possibility, uh, one's on context. And they're, they're a case study from various projects and then a, a, a conversation with a co-researcher and then applications to the history of HIV. And I have a stigma podcast uh, you could check out and we have almost 11,000 downloads. So um, yeah, so I'm done now. Look forward to your questions, comments. Bob, you're muted. Thank you, Carmen. Just very quickly before turning it over to Stephen. Th thank you. Thank you very much for a very an excellent um, presentation of, of clearly a very rich um, body of work um, and, and diverse body of work. So very much appreciated. Um, over to you and, and Carmen, Stephen. Thanks, Bob. Um, we have a question that was submitted uh, early on in your presentation. Uh, Ayana Miller asks, due to traditions, wouldn't it be harder for one to open up uh, as compared to dealing with a city youth that's a little more open due to a lack of tradition in the household? I didn't hear the first part of the question. I'm sorry. You're fine. Uh, due to traditions, wouldn't it be harder for one to open up as compared to dealing with a city youth that's a little more open due to lack of tradition in the household? Um, is this regarding rural versus urban context? Yeah. Yeah, I do think I'd say that it's actually a little tricky because what we found was if, if this is about the work with refugees, I, I think that, yeah. So what we found was there's a lot going on in the city. So the folks, the young people we, we live with in Kampala are hard to hard to nail down because they're they're moving about. There's a lot going on. <laughs> they have phones. <laughs> so they're doing they're actually quite busy. Whereas um, the, the refugee youth we're working with in um, BDBD in a refugee settlement, there's not a lot going on. So they're very available to talk with you. <laughs> so we were actually able to keep like 95% like retention in a study, which is like to me, unbelievably great uh, in a refugee settlement. But that's because th they actually have less going on. Like they don't, the, the youth we're working with, like only I think 30% have phones and it's not the busy life of a city. So, so I don't know um, necessarily if there was a difference in opening up, but there was, people had more time and more, um, more interest, I think, in the refugee, in the more rural area because they had less going on. And so at one point we thought, uh, you know, we don't want people waiting because people don't like to wait in the city. <laughs> like the youth don't like, they don't want to be waiting. They don't want to be left waiting. Um, and uh, our collaborators are like, no, actually they love waiting because they get to hang out with one another and it's a, a space to connect. So, so it's been more the trying to nail down the fast paced city life youth versus the, the easier to navigate. I, we haven't noticed necessarily a difference in and, and, and opening up based on that. But it could also be that where people are from, 
we haven't actually asked if they're from rural areas or from urban areas. So that could also be their own backgrounds might, you know, might also shape shape their, their experiences. I don't know if that answered the question. Great. Thanks, Carmen. Um, again, a reminder to everyone, if you have a question for Carmen, you could use the Q&A feature or the raise hand detail. It looks like you have a question. Carmen, thank you so much. This is um, an amazing body of work, as, as Bob said, um, and you know that I'm an admirer. Um, I am curious, uh, given all your work, um, a, lot, a lot of the intersectional stigma work is qualitative. And I, I'm wondering whether you have any thoughts about assessing uh, stigma in an intersectional way or the intersectional assessment of stigma. Yeah, thanks for that point. I, I, I have um, been working on that a lot with a Canadian uh, data set, and, and maybe I should have presented that. We had an article last year in Social Science and Medicine with the Women Living with HIV data, where we, we looked at um, intersectional stigma in two different ways. So with structural equation modeling, so we looked at what would it look like if we looked at, I should have included that. Oh, I, I removed that slide, Theo. I should have, I, sh I had a slide about the quantitative measurement. I can send, the, the article is actually open access. Um, but we looked at um, in a latent construct that included um, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, and HIV stigma, and pathways to the HIV care cascade. And then we looked at it as observed variables. So we looked at like the, the independent paths from HIV stigma, gender and racial discrimination. And we actually found differences. So it, to me, I think that's the most important thing is that there's, um, you know, in, in the article that Janet Turan led that I was part of and, and in our own work, we're just experimenting with different ways to look at intersectional stigma quantitatively. I, I, I did it less so probably in my own um, work globally, just because our sample size isn't as huge. So you know, in the in the Chivo study that I was presenting the sex work data from, that's where we've been doing a lot of um, mapping, you know, HIV stigma, gender discrimination, racial discrimination to violence, for instance, we've done that, um, published a paper on uh, the, you know, in Journal of the National AIDS Society on looking at on that and then and longitudinally on how HIV stigma actually contributes to gender um, based violence. Uh, we also looked at HIV stigma, uh, racial and gender discrimination. And that was in, in preventive medicine. And that was pathways to quality of life, health related, uh, physical and mental health related quality of life via social support and economic insecurity. So really trying to look at social and structural pathways to health outcomes with women living with HIV. And yeah, and the one that I was just mentioning where we looked at latent construct um, versus non-latent construct in, in structural equation modeling. That, that to me is interesting because it really shows how us as researchers, how our decisions on how we, we do modeling and statistical modeling really shape the outcomes. Because it, you know, I really pushed on, on, on showing that there's different ways you can do this as long as you know that you're making that decision and that what you do has implications, right? Because if, if we, yeah, it, I don't think there's, you know, there's a lot of debate in the field. Some people are saying, you know, you should do intersectional quantitative research this way. Um, there's been some other really interesting work that has shown that if you just have the everyday discrimination scale and just ask people, you know, what, what, what are you experiencing discrimination about? Um, that scale might not and, and, and you know it's been published, uh, you know, and also in social science and medicine. That skill doesn't adequately reflect the lived experiences across multiple dim dimensions of stigma. So, like perceived, um, enacted, internalized, all those stigma and the ways that they are different. So, the stigma I experience, you know, that's related to um, LGBT stigma or or, or sexual stigma. Um, is actually fundamentally different than stigma somebody experienced related to racism. So uh, those are just different. I'm, you know, for me, I'm not going to be pulled as a white person pulled over in a car uh, for the color of my skin. So that my actual fundamental experience of uh, stigma discrimination is different based on the different identities. There are maybe some underlying similarities, but there has been some you know, there's actually a really great article in social science medicine that shows that everyday discrimination skill doesn't work 
perfectly well across multiple different kinds of stigma discrimination because they're actually different drivers and different facilitators of those stigma. Uh, we have some other really interesting work. Um, it's in peer review, but mapping poverty onto experiences of HIV stigma. And so there's some really interesting work in um, Letty uh, led a paper, I think it was published in AIDS that I was a co-author on that looked at a poverty related stigma and HIV outcomes. So there is definitely a lot of people in this space of quantitative um, analysis. For some reason, yeah, the, the work I presented today was fairly qualitative, <laughs> but the, yeah, the sample sizes aren't as big as I wish, you know? <laughs> that's perfectly fine, Carmen. You, you made two important comments for me. One is that we as researchers to some extent create our outcomes. And, um, and the other one is that stigma uh, is something different dependent upon the stigmatizing feature that you're looking at and you cannot just add it up. Yeah, it really, I think there are nuances and, and there are benefits to say adding it up and having you know, a cumulative score. Um, but then we also lose a lot of the nuance around, you know, does an act of stigma contribute to internalized stigma, right? So like those dimensions are, are a little bit different and, and our, our responses need to be different um, and also intersectional. <laughs> so it's complicated, you know, but I, I think why do we still have um, racism? You know, we haven't put our whole heart into ending racism. I think, yeah, in the last year and a half, there's been more attention, but why do we still have, you know, HIV stigma, um, <clears throat> misinformation in various contexts with a high prevalence? Um, <clears throat> has there's just not been enough attention to treatment literacy, you know? So I do think, why is there still such a gender-based violence and gender discrimination, you know, including in the US right now and in Canada and all over the world. <laughs> so we haven't put our attention. And so I think our, our responses need to be nuanced um, and also look at the, you know, look at the intersectionality within, within who, you know, when we think about gender-based violence, you have to remember trans women of color and their disproportionate rates of violence. And, you know, so, so I, I think, What I worry about with the quantitative intersectional stigma research is, in, and that's why I did the scoping review, is that it becomes sort of a practice of, of fancy statistics. Like, you know, you can do this really amazing modeling, but at the end of the day, like, are we getting any uh, information that can inform our solutions? You know, like, are we, are we uh, recognizing the strengths of, of communities and the ways that they are, you know, when we can look at so social support, it, it's still such a general term and it's such a multifaceted concept, but, you know, if, if we know that social support works <laughs> to mitigate the effects of stigma, then maybe we need to be resourcing that, you know, and not just letting people just try to get support wherever they can, or if we know that, poverty is a driver of stigma, that we need to actually be addressing the poverty, you know, like, but poverty is worth addressing on its own. Anyways. Thank, thanks, Carmen. Uh, we have a couple of questions from uh, one of our center co-directors, Gina Wingard. Um, let me allow her to talk. Hi, Steve. Hi. Hi, Carmen. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was really, really lovely. I Love your work, thank you so much for it. So here at the HIV Center, one of our big aims is of course, you know, conduct research to end the HIV epidemic. And of course we feel that um, some of the work that you're doing and stigma, intersectional stigma is really critical in this area. And you were very helpful. Your presentation had lots of like um, frameworks and theories and all of that, which is very, very, very helpful. So of course, in the HIV center, we deal with diverse populations, underrepresented populations. And you've talked about how to address sort of stigma and sort of um, looking at it indiv individually within that one person. But how might you conceptualize it when you're looking across diverse people, you know, black women, trans women, gay, innocent, you know what I mean? So just from a little bit of a wider perspective. Do you mean um, like structurally or at community levels? Structurally, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think 
it depends because not everybody is, you know, as I mentioned, experiencing the same kind of exactly. Yes, exactly. I, yeah. I do think having an enabling legal environment. So um, protecting the rights of trans people and LGBT people as a whole. So yeah. protecting their, their human rights from discrimination, which is, you know, still not happening in 69 countries There's still criminalization. And even in the US, um, there's a lot of debate over uh, trans rights. So that's yeah. like a really clear um, way that protecting um, the legal rights of sex workers and yeah. not just decriminalizing, but people being like, empowered to seek justice yeah, so yeah. that really means we have to think about the the justice system or the injustice system and, and really think deep and meaningful change about how people are treated if they're a sex worker and they want to report sexual violence for instance um if they're but also i mean if we just want to use just say just say sex work as an example the discrimination that sex workers get from healthcare providers um, and the way that that's translated across all different types of care, you yeah. know, on their files yeah. is, is such a, it's, a, it's something that is actionable. Like we could, yeah. you know, the legal change, yes, we need to decriminalize sex work and we need to stop, you know, banning the ways that sex workers prefer to advertise their services, you know, whether that's on Craigslist or whatever it is, I'm, I'm, I'm placing the wrong online platform but you know whatever it is that so that sex workers have more agency and more um, occupational health and safety standards yeah. and then and at the legal system that also means transgender people have rights um and and, and are free from discrimination and lgbtq folks but then you know yeah. even when people have these enshrined rights they're not realized like you know the, the racial uh, profiling and disproportionate incarceration of um in in both in Canada yeah. and in the U.S. So that it really was, means you need to change hearts and minds. Like we need the legal change, but then we have to invest more in social change, like yeah. in truly getting to the root of, of a lot of these different kinds of stigma discrimination. So I feel like we, we even though, I don't know, I, I think we need to be really more targeted and precise. So there yeah. needs to be the legal change, but nobody's investing in actually like, changing our 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 entire um yeah social fabric that that dehumanizes sex workers that dehumanizes people of and health. i was just thinking dehumanizing people because policing is like of course a major issue here in the u.s and probably in canada as it well is. yeah and there's there's work obviously going on there but there probably needs to be a lot more work going on in that area of policing when you mention laws and it's the laws but who's enforcing the laws or not enforcing the laws or whatever they're doing but um I yeah, also and incarceration like the, systems right like people are not having just, access to clean needles yeah. i worked with people who you who inject drugs um that have been incarcerated and the uh, the, mm -hmm. the mistreatment towards people who use drugs is and especially is. people who inject drugs i just came yeah. from a month in vancouver uh it's it's shocking um yeah. it's still going on that people are are treated like less than he, you know dehumanizing yeah, yeah yeah but i did like your frameworks of um i've done work in collective advocacy and i think you're right not as many people do work in that area and i think that just shines a different light on what we could do and i think that's a social cohesion collective advocacy all those areas i think are really um ripe for further research but thank you so much yeah no thank you it is a good question i feel daunted by it i feel inspired <laughs> by your question and i'm like well there's the legal and then there's the community if we were really to yeah. you know it's always been communities of people living with hiv it's always been like like a gay a trans community organizing that has has really sparked a lot of of, of change um in society and laws and, and the way that people are treated I think it's like it, it, we need like this fire needs to be burning strongly and yeah. not just tapering in and out when it's like in the news. Yeah. So it needs to be this concerted. And you will. Yeah. Yeah. Effort. And, and it comes down to even, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, it's political like yeah. forces of it. What are you allowed to teach in school? Critical race yeah. theory, you know, things like this. I mean, if, it really comes down to what are we teaching children and yeah. um, 
and then as adults, how can we unlearn and be committed to being an ally if, if we're not part of a community that's being marginalized? And how can we leverage our power to support um, other communities uh, that have that have less? You know, that's why yeah. I think community-based research is really yeah. 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 the key. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Gina, for your question. Um, Again, everyone, if you have a question, please use the raise hand feature or you can enter it in the Q&A. Tail? I don't mind asking questions, Carmen, since you're here. I think we should, we <laughs> Good. Should, we I like should it. make full use of you. Um, I thought your... Uh, the introduction of that flourishing concept was quite interesting. I, I hadn't heard of that before. And uh, I think it's interesting. And I want to challenge you to see if you can link that concept with your structural model. Well, first, I will say, <laughs> I, I did a talk um, for the WRI, the Women Research Initiative, the HIV initiative and it was on you know another topic and the last slide was on flourishing and that's all everybody wanted to talk about and that's really what resonated <laughs> and so i'm co-chairing the national hiv conference for canada and it's going to be the theme the theme is towards equity and flourishing so flourishing is my new thing so thank you for asking about that i think i think it's that we need to make a new model because that that model and, and i've been challenged on that too and I, i'm just one of the co-authors of the model but that model the health stigma discrimination framework doesn't have a space for any strengths so i think that there's um a need for you know and even i need we need to crack that open it's, it's like we need to crack how you know there's cracks in the concrete and there is flowers and there's little grass that grows out of the concrete that's a structure and there's always cracks in it so I feel like we need to put a crack in that health stigma and discrim discrimination figure like we did in my intersectional stigma framework that we worked on um, we have the that little slice in there so I do feel like we need to crack open the health stigma discrimination to, to have space that is multi-level so flourishing is not just about you but it's about what does it mean to live well in the context of your community so what does it mean for your community to live? Like, what are your community goals and aspirations? And, um, and then your own, you know, your relational and then your, your personal. So I, I think that I like the concept of flourishing because it, it doesn't make it be a response to adversity, which resilience is. And even though we're, we, we know, we know resilience is, is, is multi-level and it can be collective and individual. A lot of the ways resilience is, is, it has a, a bad rap for being very individual focused. So I think you're right. It, there's no space in that model for, for strengths. And we need, to, we need to think about it. I, you're inspiring me to think about it. Cause I do think it needs to be in that foundation, that foundation that is the multi-level model in that foundation. We need to sort of like put a crack in there and then show how there are all of these ways that, that people are, 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 are not just, are not, not just existing, but are living good lives, you know. But you can also wonder, Carmen, uh, Carmen um, because it's, it's interesting that in the definition that you showed, there is the word luxury. And I was thinking, well, yeah, flourishing is nice, but if there's no resilience, why talk about flourishing? Would that make it's, sense? Or do you feel grow, like it's no? To, it's to grow luxuriantly. So it's about a luxuriant growth. That was in the dictionary. That's not in the, the definition in the, the BMJ one. I think, I, I think that's a really, I mean, I'd be interested in looking at that with you is to think what is the relationship between resilience and flourishing? I think, you know, the resilience literature that I am really excited about is, is from the, eco, the ecological health framework where it's, there's a forest fire and what, what comes after the forest fire is, is new growths, unexpected growths, um, different things than, than what were there before. And that's actually where the, the root of the, the term resilience is from is 
from the environmental sciences. <laughs> um, and then I was kind of brought into uh, more psychological sciences in ways that I don't know have been as transformative. I, I know that I don't know. I know like Michael Ungaro's work is amazing and he does talk about um, the social context and social ecological context of resilience. So I haven't thought enough about how resilience and flourishing meet, but, but I think that's a good question. <laughs> I might reach out to you. Maybe we'll, we'll write something on that together. Great. <laughs> Invitation accepted. <laughs> Uh, we have a comment from Ayana Miller. Let me allow her to talk. You can go ahead, Ayana. Oh, awesome. Uh, love Hi, Ayana, I see you've been mentioning things in the chat, but I'm very bad at multitasking, so I have not been reading them all. No, it's okay. It's okay. Listen, it was it's awesome, and the studies that you're doing, it's, you know, because I relate it to the work that I do every day. And I'm from New York, so of course, when it comes down to sex work and you're dealing with people, you know, high risk activities, even with knowing, you get me? And so what I try to do to combat stigma is, uh, say I have a newly diagnosed patient or even um, one that's out of care, what I try to do is share the fact of the importance of taking their meds and to break the stigma, you know, I. I try to relate it to the youths and adults, like I said in the comments, that were born with it. They didn't have a choice. So when you, you think about um, the label of it being a sexually transmitted disease, when you have young adults that, are, that have been taking meds from young, you understand, that did not have this choice to whether wear condoms, preventive ways, risk, risk reductions and whatnot, they've been living their lives to adulthood thriving, you know, being resilient, not, you know, pretty much just living their lives the best that they can, taking their meds every day. I try to compare it to, let's say, uh, diabetes, um, juvenile diabetes, or even COVID that happens to be taking, you know, taking lives at an enormous, large rate faster than HIV is. So that's one way that I do, I would like to combat, combat stigma. And another way is by zero discordant couples, couples that have been living long-term, um, you know, uh, talking about the struggles within their relationship and the positive factors in the relationship because uh, nothing screams more than having uh, a good background and uh, if I'm not mistaken, you know, I'm sorry, uh, the support, the support system. And that be not just with the, in the relationship, but with family and friends, you know? So those serial discordant couples can definitely put an ease to the stigma of HIV in, in a whole. Um, when you were talking about Jamaica, my background is, is West Indian and Jamaica has always been a, a very big issue when it came down to same sex couples and whatnot. Um, I know one of their, major activists, he passed away, unfortunately, uh, due to violence, which was about years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so, De Dexter? Yes. Yeah. So when you want to think about, yeah. they, it's, it's, it's the yeah. idea that mm -hmm. acceptance would be um, almost like saying that you're against religion. You know how everybody has their ideas of where religion falls and that you make and say Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> so the idea of acceptance, it's like you really have to tackle people on an individual level, you know? Um, yeah, but I, yeah, you brought up such good points. But, um, I appreciate your studies and I'm looking forward to, to hearing more on how to combat stigma. Um, that's, uh, honestly, I think that zero discord in the couples would definitely help a whole lot, especially people that were born with it because you can't speak for anybody that's a, but somebody that's literally lived through it, you know, from yeah, the this, beginning. You brought up some really good points. Is it Ayana or Ayana? Yes, no, you got me, Ayana. Ayana. Um, about the Soda Scordon couples, we did some work in Lesotho and Eswatini, 
Um, and that actually came up uh, as, as a really wonderful source of social support. So we've been looking at you know, deconstructing the idea of social support into um, formal and informal you know, sources and you know, the, the support that is, is helpful and less helpful. But we did actually get a lot of stories from folks in Lesotho around um, being supported in a zero discordant relationship. And we're actually doing an intervention on HIV self-testing right now in, um, in a refugee settlement in the north of Uganda. And we're using comic books for that too. And we are using the zero discordant couple as, as one of the examples. So I, I'm happy to share that with you when, when, when it's finished, it's still being made. Um, the other point you said about young people who are born with HIV, I did a small project with some young people born with HIV in Canada, and um, and I know there's a lot of work out of the U.S. on this and, and how um, their outcomes are often poorer after they transition to adult adult care. And I know from from my relationship with several of the young people in the study who are now like not so young, they're in their mid twenties now. I mean, it's young compared to me, um, but they still experience a lot of stigma. Actually, on my podcast, um, Maluba, if you're interested, Maluba is a young woman who was born with HIV, um, but she talks about how she had like a double life growing up, how she wasn't, you know, able to tell any of her friends. Um, that she was living with HIV as a child or this, you know, because it would then come out that her family was living with HIV and then they would experience stigma. Mm -hmm. And so she, you know, she did talk about this tension of holding this secret for, 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 for decades. And then the challenges of dating, because even though we know you equals you, not everybody knows you equals you, <laughs> but I right. do think that we need to amplify more of the Sarah discordant, um, relationships as positive examples of ways that people have been navigating and overcoming stigma. I think that's really, I, I really appreciate that point. I think it's really, really, really important. So thank you, Ayanna. Thank you. Uh, we might have time for one more question, if there is one. If not, Bob, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Carmen. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, Carmen, have safe travels. We know you have some big trips coming up, and you're traveling <laughs> to Sub-Saharan Africa tomorrow. Um, be well and be safe. And, and thank you so much for spending the time with us today. And this was really very rich and, and very important. So um, thank, thank you, you for everyone. having me. And thank you for participating. It was actually really fun. And thanks so much. Great. Thanks. So be, well, be well, everyone, and we'll see. Um, Hopefully see you all on the 18th for David Holgrave um, Grand Rounds. Take care. Be well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.